a quiet suburban home becomes the scene of a gruesome murder. Detectives are left without suspects or motive. Clues to solving it could be anywhere or nowhere. Investigators suspect that a woman's fatal fall was no accident. Now they must prove it step by step. When a murder exposes a family secret and a cast of shady characters, detectives don't know whom to believe. Killers have their own warped reasons for murder. Some kill for love, some seek vengeance, and others hope to line their pockets with blood money. In this case, the names of the victim and her family have been changed. On December 16, 1994, Len Gruber of Oklahoma City came home to spend his lunch hour with his wife, Carla. Christmas was less than two weeks away, and there was plenty to do. In an instant, the pleasant lunch he had planned turned into undiluted horror. Carla lay dead between the kitchen and the dining room. She was naked except for a single sock. A pair of pinking shears jutted from her chest. Oklahoma City Police Department. Yes, it's an emergency. My wife's been stabbed. Police processed the scene. From the looks of it, the victim had fought mightily against her attacker. There was no evidence of sexual assault. Though signs of a struggle were found throughout the house, the epicenter seemed to be the kitchen. Drawers were upended, and the killer had apparently tried several weapons before choosing the pinking shears. The countertop bore a fresh knife strike, A broken knife and a bloodied barbecue fork lay on the floor. Detective Bob Bemo of the Oklahoma City Police Department didn't know what to make of such unbridled violence. But he knew where to start. Both my partner and I realized that we had a a uh, heck of a situation because this was a what we could refer to as a whodunit homicide although we did immediately suspect the husband Len Gruber gave police a statement Carla and Len were active in their church and married 30 years Len told police that he had last seen his wife alive that morning she had taken the day off to do some last-minute Christmas shopping. Good morning, honey. Len had planned to come home for lunch and help decorate and wrap gifts. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. He left for the office as he normally did and returned home a few hours later to find his wife dead. He didn't know who could have done this. He answered all questions and was very deliberate in his answers and very cool and collected, uh, which you consider highly unusual with a, a, a spouse after he's found his wife horribly murdered. I would have expected more emotion coming from him or him to break down or to be crying. This is basically why he uh, became a suspect. But investigations are driven by facts, not feelings. Gruber's co-workers told police he had been at the office all morning. 
His wife's estimated time of death indicated that he couldn't have killed her before he left for work. And he passed a polygraph. Len Gruber was off the suspects list. And that meant there were no suspects. Because there were no signs of forced entry, police surmised that the killer might have been someone the victim had known. Ask you a few questions. Uh, Police brought Gruber in for questioning, Normal morning, hoping that he would provide breakfast. them with some detail, some clue they may have overlooked that would reveal a possible suspect. Like I said, I saw her, uh, Though he knew it was unlikely, was Gruber provided the names of people in his prayer group. Morning, I said goodbye, breakfast. He couldn't think of anyone else his wife yeah. might have been in contact lunch, with. The victim kept an immaculate home, so fingerprints were few and far between. Those found at the point of entry belonged to the Grubers or their neighbors. Except for a single thumbprint pulled from the storm door. Who it belonged to was anyone's guess. The forensic investigation continued. In the hallway between the bedroom and the kitchen, they examined the carpet and found faint blood stains. To make the blood easier to see, they used a chemical called luminol, which glows upon contact with blood. It revealed that the attack had proceeded from the bedroom door and down the hall. In one spot, the luminol disclosed boot prints. Detectives weren't sure if they were useful okay, or not. We're ready for you. Officer Jones, come let's take a The star Please pattern say. resembled the tread on the boots that police officers wear. They feared the scene had been contaminated. Detective Bimo had to be sure before he discounted this potential clue. I had quite a few of our officers at the scene that stick their boots up so that we could photograph the bottoms of their boots in order to match it with this print. None of them matched. The print provided one more piece of evidence against an unknown assailant. Investigators had collected utensils and blood samples from all over the house, hoping to find even more. According to forensic chemist Elaine Taylor, they had no way of telling what might be important. A lot of times um, there's a lot of extraneous evidence that may be collected that uh, as time goes by you ultimately find out it had absolutely nothing to do with the crime scene, but it, it was collected anyway. The house yielded a large amount of evidence. It would take days to sort it all out. Most compelling was a single drop of blood that didn't seem to belong to the victim. It was collected from a corner of the kitchen, far from where Carla Gruber had fought for her life. My first impression was there was no way that the victim could ever have made it to that area where the blood on the chair was. I felt very confident of all the blood stains that were collected at the crime scene that that was, in my opinion, going to be one of the most important. Investigators needed to see if this blood matched the victim's blood. They used a process called electrophoresis to separate specific enzymes out of each sample. Certain enzymes vary from person to person. Electrophoresis utilizes an electric current to separate the enzymes for analysis. The sample is placed in a gel and a current is applied, causing the enzymes to move through the gel. Each enzyme moves a certain distinct distance creating a pattern of bands. If two blood samples create the same pattern, it's probable they came from the same source. In this case, the bands from the victim's blood and the blood from the chair did not match. The blood was not the victim's. Blood samples from the Gruber's friends, relatives, and neighbors were also gathered for testing. 
no match there either. Investigators were confident that whoever shed this truck had killed the victim. But they still had no idea who that person was. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. As investigators collected clues to the murder of Carla Gruber, the victim's husband, Len, collected his thoughts. I think they made the case. According to Detective Bob Bimo, his recollection helped jog the investigation. He had remembered a, a subject by the name of Eric Patton who had, had worked for him and had done some uh, painting to his residence during the summer months of June and July. Len had met Patton at the telemarketing firm where he worked. The Grubers knew he had a prison record, but they weren't interested in that. They believed he deserved another chance. They hadn't seen him since he'd finished painting six months earlier. Somebody else that was there yesterday, but it wasn't me. Patton was called in for questioning. He told police that he had served time in California for minor burglary. He confirmed that he hadn't been to the Gruber's house since the summer. After he left the station, detectives did some checking on him. They learned that he had asked to have his parole moved to Oklahoma so he could be with his family and girlfriend. Detective Bimo contacted his parole officer to check his story. And I found that he had been involved in several armed robberies where he used a knife and a pair of scissors. The scissors uh, uh, were quick uh, to catch my eye and uh, my, uh, my partner and I both felt like that we had something here. On December 22nd, six days after the murder, Carla Gruber was laid to rest. Investigators used the opportunity to look for potential suspects by photographing those attending. The main reason that you photograph these individuals is to find out if somebody who's been uh, named is there, also somebody that hasn't been named shows up and you want to know who they are. You never know. It, it's uh, unusual, but in some cases the suspect has been known to attend the funeral. This was one of those cases. The suspect, Eric Patton, was there. Len Gruber identified him from photographs taken at the funeral. Because he barely knew the victim, his attendants raised suspicions, but provided no real evidence of guilt. The best proof would likely come from the physical evidence. The Oklahoma City Police Forensics Lab sorted out the items collected from the crime scene. Attention focused on a bloody barbecue fork retrieved from the kitchen. Investigators wondered if the killer's prints were engraved in Carla Gruber's blood. After photographing the fork to document it, technicians shined an alternate light source over it. Prints too faint to be seen in ordinary light can often be revealed through light of a different wavelength. None turned up, but that didn't mean none were there. The next step was treatment with a chemical called diamidobenzidine. It reacts with blood proteins, clinging to them and turning them brownish red. The chemical was applied and then developed, revealing a single, clear print. It matched the print from Eric Patton's previous arrest report. So did the print on the Gruber's storm door. Who is that? Are you Eric Patton? Yes, sir. I have a warrant for your arrest. Right here. A warrant for my arrest for what? Police made their arrest. Boots were found that matched the tread pattern photographed at the crime scene. They too belonged to Patton. 
Two weeks later, DNA tests proved the blood drop on the kitchen chair was his. That was all they needed. The significance of the uh, blood at the, the scene being foreign to the victim, but consistent with the suspect, Mr. Patton, uh, tied him to the crime scene. The morning that I actually arrived, Faced with the overwhelming evidence, uh, Eric Patton confessed. He told authorities that he needed money for drugs. He thought he'd find some at the Gruber's house, not expecting anyone to be there. When he saw that Carla Gruber was home, he modified his plan. She invited him in. I need to borrow some money. When he asked for money, she went to find some, though she told him she didn't keep any in the house. But Patton was desperate, and he committed a desperate act. Because of the heinous nature of his crime, Eric Patton received the death penalty. <laughs> Things often aren't as they first appear. A killer could visit in the guise of a friendly acquaintance. And an accident could turn out to be no accident. On June 7, 1988, paramedics in Tyler, Texas, were called to the home of 66-year-old Betty Lucas. Her son, Stephen, reported that she had fallen down the stairs while he was visiting. She had critical head injuries, and her vital signs grew weak. Paramedics stabilized her for transport to the hospital. The there, Betty Lucas's condition continued to worsen. The following day, Stephen Lucas made the difficult decision to have his mother taken off life support. She's in a deep coma. Within a few hours, if Betty Lucas was dead. I'm asking you, is she going to come out of this? I don't know, Mr. Lucas. Two days later, the Tyler Police Department received an anonymous call advising them to investigate her death. What looked like an accident, the caller said, might really be a murder. The caller suggested looking more closely at Stephen Lucas. The tip was forwarded to Detective Danny Alexander. Not certain what to make of the information, he began looking into the facts of Betty Lucas's death. He knew that the victim had been well known and well liked. Betty Lucas was a very wealthy, influential person in this community. Her husband had been the mayor of the city of Tyler at one time. Um, he owned a business here in Tyler, a real estate business that was very successful prior to his death. The allegation that Betty's son intentionally murdered her seemed preposterous. But police were obliged to follow the lead. The investigation started at the hospital. The treating physician told police that Betty Lucas had died from irreparable brain damage. Her wounds were confined to her head. They seemed inconsistent with the type of fall her son described. Investigators now had to wonder if there was some truth to the anonymous tip. But investigators had lost valuable time. According to Texas law, authorities must be notified about any unnatural death that occurs within 24 hours of admission to a hospital. Betty Lucas's death fell into this category but her doctor had been unaware of the rule and had released her for burial. At that point, we were behind in the game. Uh, evidence had been uh, possibly lost uh, or was no longer available to us. Uh, and the fact was that uh, within a couple hours of our notification, she was to be buried. 
By the time police began their investigation, her body was already gone. Alexander learned from the doctor that Stephen Lucas had acted strangely while his mother was in the hospital. He had been unwilling to provide details about the accident and demanded that she be buried as soon as possible once she was declared dead. Stephen had not notified Betty's family in South Carolina uh, of her being admitted to the hospital, nor did he notify them that she had died and was buried. It was time to talk to Stephen Lucas. Investigators met him and his daughter Stephanie at the victim's home to hear their account of the accident. Stephen told them that he and Stephanie had stopped over around dinner time to return Betty's VCR. He said that Betty was angry with him because he didn't want to attend an upcoming charity event. She then accused him of breaking her VCR and demanded it back. Stephen didn't want her to carry the heavy machine herself, but she refused his help. After a tug of war at the top of the stairs, she jerked it up and over her shoulder. The next thing Stephen knew, his mother had fallen over the banister and tumbled down the steps. Are you okay? Steve indicated that when she hit the staircase that she then began to slide down the staircase, her head bouncing on each step as she went down. And that when she had reached the bottom of the staircase, uh, she was in the foyer area, that she set up briefly and then fell back hitting her head one last time on the last stair of the staircase. Okay? Stephen said that he immediately ran to the bottom of the stairs and moved his mother's head from the bottom step to the marble floor. Go get help, Steph. Go get help. He then sent Hurry. Stephanie to get help from a neighbor Please. while he called an ambulance. Stephanie Sorry. said she saw her father and grandmother fighting, but because they always squabbled, she wasn't alarmed. The detective didn't get much more information out of the young woman. When you ask her about uh, any questions and tried to pin her down into, into a specific story, she would be very evasive and finally would say, I'm not sure. The next thing I knew... Stephen was asked to walk through the scene and recreate what had happened. When he and Stephanie were asked separately where Betty was standing before the fall, they identified locations at least 20 feet apart. Police found no evidence of a struggle at either point. There was another puzzling detail. A neighbor told police that Stephen Lucas and his daughter Stephanie didn't accompany Betty to the hospital immediately after the accident. Instead, they had stayed behind to clean the blood off the floor. Not only was it odd behavior for worried family members, it eliminated a vital source of evidence. After questioning the witnesses and examining the scene, police still had no clear idea how the victim fell. They had no way of corroborating the Lucas's vague stories or any way of proving that they were lying. A lot of unanswered questions were buried along with Betty Lucas. With every passing day, the body of Betty Lucas would have less and less information to divulge. If police were going to get to the bottom of this case, they'd need to get to the bottom of her grave. Investigators hoped that an examination of the victim's remains would clear up some of the discrepancies between Lucas's account and the suspicions that swirled around him. A week after her death, a court ordered Betty Lucas exhumed for autopsy. The autopsy began with a visual inspection. In serious falls, one normally sees large contusions, scraped skin, and most notably, broken bones, especially in a 66-year-old woman. But x-rays turned up no broken bones or dislocated joints. Pathologist Virgil Gonzalez could find no indication of a fall. And if she hit the stair, there will be a grazing type 
of abrasion on the skin because of the carpet, a burned skin. But there is no scraping or a grazing type of injuries in any part of Mrs. Lucas' body. The injuries were all confined to the head and the skull. Gonzalez discovered a major discrepancy in Stephen Lucas's account. Shaving revealed seven clean-cut lacerations on the top of her head. If, as Stephen said, she'd received her wounds by sliding down the stairs, only the back of her head would have been injured. From these seven lacerations, Gonzalez could draw only one conclusion. Betty Lucas is not an accidental death. It's a homicide. No matching weapon was found, but investigators were certain that Betty Lucas's wounds could not have come from a fall. After the autopsy, police spoke with Stephanie a second time. Her comments made it clear that she didn't see the fatal fall and wasn't directly involved. Based on the autopsy findings and the family's inconsistent stories, the police classified Betty Lucas's death a homicide. And Stephen Lucas was their main suspect. The investigators returned to the home of Betty Lucas to build their case. Good shots in this area. They didn't have a lot to go on. Go ahead and take there were no signs of damage on or near the second floor banister where the struggle had supposedly occurred. Try to get as many as you can. Investigators could find no clues to trace the victim's trajectory down the stairs. No evidence was found at the top of the stairs, but the staircase was hardly pristine. Midway up the stairs, investigators found gouges, dents, and scrapes to the wall and molding. A painting was pulled away from the wall, as if someone had clung to it for balance. Sharp cuts marked the banister. The victim's maid confirmed that the damage was fresh. Blood was found on the balusters at the base of the stairs. Investigators had found a spot that Stephen and Stephanie's cleaning had missed. In that area, we also found very small amounts of blood, which would indicate to us that at some point, Betty Lucas's head had rested on that step or something had happened to get blood in that area. As the investigation progressed, police searched for motive Investigators learned that Stephen and Betty's relationship had soured after Stephen failed to repay her a $350,000 loan. Things had recently gone from bad to worse when she refused to give him another $50,000. With Betty dead, Stephen's debt would be relieved, and he stood to inherit even more money from her estate. She controlled the money in the family, um, and he was in... Uh, financial trouble and needed that money and a lot of arguments especially right before her death centered around him wanting to borrow money get more money from her on November 10th 1988 armed with a motive and forensics that seemed to disprove Stephen Lucas's account police arrested him Lucas stood trial in May but after six weeks in court and 22 hours of deliberation, it ended in a hung jury. When polled, the jurors said they weren't convinced by the forensics. The investigators had to start over. The first trial of Stephen Lucas ended in a hung jury. The weight of the evidence had failed to tip the scales toward either accident or murder. 
If the prosecution had any hope of convicting Stephen Lucas in the murder of his mother, Betty, they needed to strengthen and clarify their forensics case. The state hired Alan Weckerling, a specialist in accident reconstruction, to review the evidence. By now, years had passed since Betty Lucas's death. Her home had been sold and the staircase repaired. But a few items from the crime scene had been saved. The evidence we were interested in looking at was the um, molding on um, the stairwell and the railing on the stairwell to see if the VCR had actually flown down the stairwell and hit the railing and then ricocheted off of the wall. Weckerling began by testing Stephen's assertion that his mother had fallen from the head of the stairs. A series of deep gouges marked the top of the wooden molding. Weckerling had to confirm that these were caused by the tumbling VCR. The molding and VCR were examined under a microscope. Paint marks on the VCR matched the molding, proving that it was the source of the damage. But as he studied the molding, Weckerling made a crucial discovery. I was able to look at the wood under the microscope and based on um, really some very simple scientific principles of when you're roller painting a wall and you get the little drips of paint, gravity is going to pull those down. The paint drips proved that until now the molding had been analyzed upside down. The damage was actually on its underside and could not have come from a falling VCR, as Stephen had asserted. These cuts were made with an intentional upward stroke, damaging the molding from below and undermining Stephen's story about his mother's accidental fall. The next step was to refute the defense assertion that Betty Lucas could have tumbled over the banister and down the stairs. The defense in the first trial used a series of complex calculations to create a computer animation similar to this one, demonstrating Stephen's account of his mother's fall. The prosecution hired physicist Mike Andrews to take a closer look at the animation and defense calculations. He found that the trajectory they presented was physically impossible. What you should see is that she would just start going over the rail and just go down and land below. What we found was that the initial step, she would go through the banister instead of over the top of it. Then she would come back through and then she would do a little loop and then she would go back through it again and then fall down below. Okay, Andrews had the house measured again and used these measurements to disprove the defense scenario. Betty Lucas could not have fallen from the top of the staircase as her son Stephen had said. Police surmised that Betty Lucas had an argument with her son midway up the stairs. They struggled, creating the damage to the molding and the staircase. Betty fell, and Stephen Lucas beat her near death with an unknown weapon. Lucas stood trial again. This time, the forensic evidence proved that Betty Lucas could not have fallen accidentally. Impeccable detective work had kept a wily killer from getting away with a nearly perfect murder. There was no eyewitnesses, only the suspect and the victim. Had it not been for the evidence uncovered by the use of, of forensic science, Steve would have walked away. Stephen Lucas's plan was complete when he authorized the hospital to take his mother off life support. Stephen was found guilty of first degree murder and was sentenced to 35 years. 
Stephen Lucas tried to get away with murder by making his mother's death look like an accident. Others aren't so thorough in hiding their crime. In this case, the names of the victim and her family have been changed. In the early morning hours of February 19, 1988, a motorist in Lincoln, Nebraska, came across what looked like a one-car accident. Inside, the victim, a woman, was dead, apparently from a head injury. Lancaster County Sheriff's Department, along with the coroner's office, arrived on the scene. They could tell the situation wasn't as it appeared to be. Though the victim had suffered severe injuries, damage to the car was minimal. There were no skid marks. The gear was in part. The car keys were missing, and so was the victim's ID. And the driver's side door had a fresh puncture mark. The scene bore every indication that this was no accident. Sergeant Larry Russell led the investigation. The injuries were not that type of an injury that would be in comparison to a traffic fatality that you would normally see, the trauma. Uh, in uh, looking at the individual closer, it was uh, actually found to be uh, bullet holes that uh, some sort of projectile that had gone into the head area. The search of the area surrounding the crime scene found no gun or other apparent clues. In fact, all that was found was a pack of cigarettes, torn open from the bottom, and two pairs of house slippers, a men's pair and a women's pair. They were collected, though they didn't seem relevant. Based on the vehicle registration, the sheriff's department tentatively identified the victim as Jane Leary, age 25. Her ID was confirmed at autopsy, where her fingerprints were taken and checked against police records. She had a prior record from another state. The autopsy also confirmed that she was killed by two gunshot wounds to the head. She had no other injuries. Investigators contacted the victim's husband. He was brought in for questioning. Jack Leary didn't seem terribly surprised by the news. Police asked him to recount the events of the day before. You didn't know she was gone? Why don't you ever clean up around here? Leary told police that he and Jane had been fighting. Nothing serious, just a typical domestic quarrel. As usual, Jane took the kids to her mother's and then went off. He really didn't worry about her. A few hours later, two acquaintances of the victim showed up at the Leary home, Herman Buckman and his girlfriend, Goldie Fisher. Jack, I don't believe you. Leary admitted to we police that fight. Jane sold drugs. He we said that Buckman fight. and Fisher came there to trade a and handgun for some. Kids. When he and told now, the couple that his wife wasn't home, they left to go find her. Out. Leary suspected right. they murdered his wife. wife. That wasn't how it sounded to Detective Russell. My first initial impression uh, is that the husband definitely knew more than he was telling. It just didn't seem likely that, gosh, you arrive at a at a individual's house and you say, hey, your wife has just been shot. And uh, the guy comes up with, well, oh, yeah, there were some people here the night before, and they were wanting to sell a gun for drugs. And it just didn't seem real believable initially, uh, primarily because of his demeanor. While Jack Leary was giving his statement, his wife's car was being scoured for clues. Investigators found little more than cigarette butts. They managed to lift some latent prints, but the ones that could be read matched only the victim.
Cigarette butts in the car were sent to the lab for analysis to see if they might reveal some clue. A test called immunoglobulin allotyping was performed on the traces of saliva on the filter. The test analyzes the presence of specific proteins found in body fluids. These proteins are genetic markers that vary to a certain degree from individual to individual. According to serologist Rena Roy, formerly of the Nebraska State Patrol Laboratory, the results weeded out most of the population, but indicated that whoever smoked the cigarettes was most likely African American. 95% of the African American population was excluded as being the donor of the saliva on the cigarette bud, as well as 99.3% of the Caucasian population. The results suggested that the victim, a Caucasian, wasn't the one who smoked the cigarettes found at the scene. The murderer possibly had. Police were now looking for an African-American suspect. Jack Leary was off the suspect's list. With no other leads, detectives had to follow Jack Leary's improbable story. They ran a check on Herman Buckman and Goldie Fisher. Both had prior records for narcotics, burglary, and assault. They called Buckman in for an interview. He wasn't the most cooperative of subjects. He said he didn't need an attorney. When Herman came into the room, I initially read him his rights. He pretty much told me to go pound sand. I'm not going to tell you anything. I wasn't there. A few other words were said, and he then asked for a cigarette. Buckman refused the deputy cigarette and said he only smoked a certain brand. Mr. Buckman, we'd like to ask you some questions, uh, uh, as you may be aware. Understand? A pack was brought to him. He opened it from the bottom. It was a habit he picked up in prison to keep the filters clean. You know, it's like a light bulb came on. I've seen this cigarette pack before somewhere, and then, of course, at the crime scene, there was a cigarette pack with the same type of tear. The interview concluded, and Buckman Mr. left, Buffin. and left behind two cigarette butts. They were collected and sent to the lab to see if the saliva from the filters matched the saliva from the ones collected from the murder scene. The same immunoglobulin allotype test was performed on these filters. Then the results were compared. The genetic markers on the filters from the car and from the ones Buckman left at the station matched closely. Looking at the results, we could conclude that Mr. Buckman could have been the donor of the saliva on this cigarette bud. The characteristics of the saliva were common to 5% of the African-American population. The margin of error was too wide. Also, the cigarette only proved that the smoker had recently been in the victim's car. It didn't prove he was the killer. The cigarette butts could have been in the car for weeks. Investigators reviewed everything they had on Buckman, trying to find holes in his story. He had told detectives that he spent the whole night with his girlfriend, Goldie Fisher. In her interview, Goldie Fisher told police that on the night of the murder, she was out with friends and went to see her mother. When's the last time you saw her? She confirmed that Herman Buckman was with her the whole time. To check her alibi, investigators paid a visit to Goldie Fisher's mother. She didn't know about the crime or that her daughter might be under suspicion. We just have some questions about your daughter. She told police that Goldie hadn't been to see her in at least four days. But Jane Leary's murder occurred only one day earlier. Thank you for having us in your home. I'm 
Goldie's alibi was starting to tarnish. In Lincoln, Nebraska, the investigation into the murder of Jane Leary led detectives to the bar that suspects Herman Buckman and Goldie Fisher frequented. Some patrons said they saw the couple there on the night of the murder. Buckman had a gun with him. Detective Russell learned something else about the pair as well. One of the things that Herman Buckman and Goldie Fisher did is they would dress rather nicely going out for the evening, but they had a very unusual thing. They both wore house slippers, uh, which isn't common in my estimations to, to go out and in house slippers. The slippers found at the crime scene, once thought to be insignificant, now were more closely analyzed. Droplets of blood were found on them. The blood matched the victims. That linked the slippers to the victim, but not necessarily to the suspects. Investigators needed something more solid. As news of the crime spread, a potential witness surfaced. She realized she'd been near the murder scene shortly after the crime occurred. She'd picked up a hitchhiker. It was around 2 a.m. on the day of the murder. The woman she picked up was acting very strangely. She had no shoes on and seemed to be in a hurry. The driver dropped her off at a nearby neighborhood. Goldie Fisher's neighborhood. The witness picked out Fisher's picture from a photo lineup. That placed Fisher at the crime scene, where she had also apparently lost her slippers and her alibi. Investigators now had enough to arrest Fisher and Buckman for suspicion of murder. With both of their suspects in custody, it was a matter of securing the case against them. Investigators set out to find evidence that placed Fisher and Buckman at the scene. When Buckman's car was searched, ski masks, a crowbar, and other burglary tools were found in the trunk, but nothing that matched the murder weapon. A search warrant also allowed investigators to collect the clothes the victim's husband described the couple as wearing the night of the murder. Traces of blood were found on the lining of Buckman's jacket and on his sweater. It was the victim's blood. With all the pieces in place, investigators were able to surmise the events leading up to the death of Jane Leary. Buckman and Fisher knew where Jane usually sold her drugs. They caught up with her, hoping to trade their gun for some dope. When she refused, they killed her for her drugs and whatever cash she had. Then, they pushed the car into the ditch. In addition to receiving 20 to 60 years for firearm possession, Herman Buckman was sentenced to life. Goldie Fisher, charged with robbery and accessory to murder, received 15 to 30 years. Homicide is the ultimate selfish act. Solving it is just the opposite. Only through the close interaction of scientists and investigators can murderers be caught and justice served. A serial killer is delivering death door to door. Detectives move in to stop him before he kills again. 
because I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Bodies begin turning up in Northern California. Investigators search for a common denominator and find a pattern of uncommon cruelty. For years, a deadly predator has taunted police while snaring victim after victim. With every kill, he grows bolder, while authorities grow more desperate to catch him. Serial killers don't stop on their own. As the body count rises, investigators must use all of their resources to put an end to their murder by numbers. Some of the names in this episode have been changed. January 12, 1990 was another beautiful day in San Diego. But Chris Burns wasn't enjoying it. He was growing concerned over the whereabouts of his fiancée. When his roommates came home, Burns asked if they'd seen Tiffany Schultz, who also shared the apartment. No, I haven't seen her all day. Why? Well, because her car's downstairs. Her car was in the parking lot, but in the several hours that Burns had been home, she hadn't appeared. The other roommates hadn't seen her either. Then they opened the door to a nightmare. What's going on? Oh my God! Schultz lay dead, partially disrobed and covered in blood. You guys, call the cops, get somebody here, all right? Burns stayed with her while his roommates called police. As detectives interviewed Burns and his roommates, San Diego homicide investigators inspected the crime scene. One of the first things they noticed was that the body was posed with outstretched arms and legs. Bruises indicated that the victim had struggled fiercely for her life. She had been stabbed multiple times in the chest. There was no sign of sexual assault. The answering machine tape was taken to check for suspicious messages. As the technicians continued working, Chris Burns told detectives his story. I put my hands up under her head like this. They noticed his hands and pants were marked with blood. The situation gave Sergeant Ed Petrick of the San Diego Police Homicide Unit grave doubts about Burns. It seemed very odd to anybody that it would be a fellow that comes home, house is open, his girlfriend's nowhere, nowhere around, but her keys are there, her car's there, her purse is there, but she's nowhere around. And there's a roommate's door to the bedroom that's closed, which is usually never closed, and he never bothers to to knock or open it. Burns was taken to the police station for further questioning about his fiancée's murder. Sam. He admitted that he and Schultz were having problems. Let me tell you why I brought you in here. The grisly slaying came at a time when they were supposedly trying to salvage their relationship. Lately, they couldn't get along. Now, Schultz was dead and Burns looked like the main suspect. The blood on his clothes told police all they needed to know. But Burns claimed that the stain on his shirt came from touching Schultz after he discovered her dead. He believed the blood on his pants was his own from a recent accident on the construction site where he worked. The story seemed too contrived. Chris Burns was arrested and charged with the murder of Tiffany Schultz. I can do that. It's not quite that. Schultz's autopsy revealed she was stabbed nearly 60 times. While researching this brutal homicide case, police learned that the victim was paying her way through college by dancing at a nightclub. Oh, yeah. 
the manager confirmed that Schultz's relationship with Burns was tumultuous. She told police that he didn't want her working there. They often came to blows over it. Their last incident had been recent. Transcripts from the answering machine tape contained an apology from Burns for the hard time he gave his fiancée about her job. But police wondered if he'd lost his temper and his control one last time. Only careful forensic analysis of the evidence could determine if Schultz was the victim of Burns' rage. Burns' shirt and pants were sent to the lab to determine whose blood was on them. To better see the blood stains, the genes were turned inside out. When the results were positive, ABO blood typing was performed. The blood on the shirt matched Schultz's AB blood type. But I'm sure we should. But the blood on the pants was type O, Burns' own type. Serologist Larry Turner of the Jackson Police Department Crime Lab performed the analysis. Based on what I found, I was able to determine that the story that Chris Burns had been telling, uh, it was possible that it was true. Uh, the blood on his clothing matched him and not that of uh, Tiffany Schultz, and on his T-shirt where he said he had been down to touch her and possibly gotten some of her blood on the T-shirt, that was correct as well. Burns' story, as odd as it seemed, might be true. Police had no other evidence with which to hold him. He was released, though still considered the prime suspect. But police would soon regret releasing him. On February 16, 1990, one month after Tiffany Schultz was found murdered, police got another call to the same apartment complex. Take a deep breath Another victim had been found, brutally hey, okay. murdered. What do you have? We got this one in the kitchen. The partially nude body of Janine Weinhold, a student at San Diego State University, was discovered by her roommate. She had been stabbed several times. As in the Schultz case, the killer also posed this body with the legs outstretched. Police feared they were dealing with a serial killer. Uh, there just wasn't any question in, in our minds that it had to be the same suspect. I mean, just the body position, um, the stab wound clusters in the chest, um, just, just looked like the same murder, basically. Different round. This murder occurred only about 100 yards from the apartment where the first victim was killed. Blood-stained clothes were found on the floor by the bed. The killer left the murder weapon, a carving knife, in the sink. But he left something else even more important. Seminal fluid was found on the bedspread. It provided evidence that the victim had been raped. It also provided police with their best hope for learning the killer's identity. In the lab, Larry Turner tested the evidence. In the early 90s, DNA testing was beyond the scope of most labs. Turner would have to rely on the older and less precise blood typing tests. He found that all of the blood and bodily fluids tested positive for type O. The blood evidence cast further suspicion on Chris Burns, the primary suspect, who had type O blood take some of the material. To be certain, Larry Turner analyzed the genetic markers within Burns' blood and in the fluid samples found at the murder scene. Genetic markers are inherited like proteins thing. that vary from individual to individual. While people may share some of the same ones, certain markers are more rare and can be used to make an ID. Genetic marker tests are dependable, but not nearly as precise as DNA. Turner found that the genetic markers of the suspect, Chris Burns, didn't match those taken from the second murder scene. That left investigators with two murders and no suspect. 
investigating the murder that occurred in the apartment complex. They returned to the apartment complex and interviewed female residents to see if they'd seen anyone suspicious. Okay, now what Police feared that these with? two victims were just the beginning. Anything from the park? Yeah. 3400 Claremont Drive, that's Detectives right. Detectives created a list of over 1,000 suspects from the leads they gathered from the victims' friends and acquaintances. About a block away. There's a couple of burglaries. With two murders unsolved, the police were casting a wide net trying to find their man before he killed again. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. On April 3rd, 1990, two months after the Weinhold murder, police received an urgent call. A woman had been found brutally stabbed. This is a house and apartment, sir. Sir, you need to calm down for me if you can. Okay, where is the suspect at? A witness saw a man with a knife fleeing the scene his face covered by a t-shirt. Can you tell me, did he have the knife with him? Police rushed to respond. They met Tammy Ho, who returned from the apartment swimming pool and found her friend, Holly Tarr, mortally wounded with a single stab through the heart. Holly Tarr's murder occurred in the same apartment building where the second victim, Janine Weinhold, was killed. Outside, police discovered the knife and the t-shirt held by the killer as he fled the scene. They also found a shoe print left in the mud, which they thought belonged to the suspect. Unfortunately, eyewitnesses couldn't identify him. The girlfriend, uh, Tammy, she basically couldn't give any description at all. Just, it was a male, you know, saw, saw a flash go by. She, she couldn't help in that area. We had a second witness who uh, at least pinned down the race of the suspect uh, as being uh, a black male. The knife and t-shirt were clean of fingerprints or hair samples. After three murders, all investigators knew for sure was that the victims were all white females between the ages of 18 and 21, left semi-nude, posed with their legs outstretched and stabbed in the heart. All they knew about the killer was that he might be an African-American. Because the slayings took place in the area of San Diego known as Claremont, the murderer was dubbed the Claremont Killer. A deadly predator, a serial killer, was on the loose. Police looked at their list of more than 1,000 suspects and, from those, re-interviewed all of their African-American suspects again. Hundreds of blood and saliva samples were voluntarily obtained. While the samples were being tested, the killing continued. On May 22, 1990, another woman was murdered in her apartment in Mid-City, San Diego. The pattern of stab wounds was similar to the previous three murders. The Claremont killer was on the move. Four months later, 43-year-old Pamela Clark and her 18-year-old daughter Amber were found murdered in their San Diego home. Both partially nude bodies bore stab wounds around the heart and were posed like the previous victims. There was no question after the double murder of the Clarks that things really, really got heated up. We had politicians show up at the mobile command post. Um, I had detectives hadn't had a day off in 40 days, uh, which was no problem. You know, they, they just, we had to catch this, this guy. But we were back to square one. Police had a terrifying killer on the loose with few clues and no idea of where he might strike next. Okay. Time was against them. Each day he ran free, more women okay. were in danger. The Claremont killer laid low for five months leaving San Diego investigators with nothing to go on. The trail heated up again on February 3, 1991, 
more than a year after he had made his first kill. Linda Parker, age 23, was about to take a shower when she heard noises at her front door. She looked through the peephole and saw a man trying to slip the lock. Linda Parker fled through her back door. She went to a neighbor's apartment, and together they confronted the would be intruder. Hey, buddy, what are you doing? Oh, I was trying to get into my friend's apartment. Who mumbled an excuse as he left. Wrong building. Parker's neighbor noted the make and model of the man's car. Meanwhile, Parker called police reporting a possible encounter with the Claremont killer. Parker suspected the man at her door had stalked her from a nearby gym. A previous victim, Pamela Clark, had worked out at the same gym right before her murder. Perhaps this was the killer's current spot for scouting victims. Officers distributed flyers and asked people at the gym if they had seen the man or the vehicle that Parker described. The next day, they received a call. Someone had spotted the man on the flyers sitting in his car outside the gym. Police apprehended the suspect. His name was Cleophus Prince. Police had interviewed him months earlier. He had declined to provide a blood sample. What I need to see Police you, needed a sample if they hoped to compare Prince's DNA to crime scene evidence. To I win his I consent, they didn't let on that he was a murder suspect. Keep it up on the table, they told please. him he was arrested for the attempted burglary of Linda Parker's home the prior day. Did you know these Investigators cards? checked his credit cards. Fact, Each had the marks of having been used to slip door locks. Is Prince cooperated and provided a blood sample without detectives having to resort to a warrant. Until the DNA results came back, police didn't have enough evidence to hold him. Prince was released, but he was kept under close surveillance. The blood sample was rushed to testing. If successful, the DNA would provide more solid evidence than genetic markers would. The problem was that in the early 90s, the technology was new, and it could take a year before the results came back. With nothing to hold the suspect, he would be free to kill again. With time running against them, investigators relied on a less comprehensive but faster test that would compare similarities between the sample and the crime scene DNA. If similarities existed, investigators could assume they were on the right track if the DNA bore no superficial resemblance, they had the wrong man. Within a month, the results came back. The test indicated a match. We just were, I mean, almost in tears. It was just unbelievable emotion involved in, in working with something and dealing with the families and, and all those crime scenes, and, and it was over. Prince was located and arrested. Oh, wow. Police were now able to gather more evidence and buy more time to run complete DNA tests. In Prince's possession were two rings that belonged to one of the victims. Police also found shoes with soles that matched the print left at a murder scene. Hey, what's going on, bud? Though police would never know what triggered his homicidal rage, they had a good idea of how his crimes evolved. Having perfected his craft as a burglar, he expanded his repertoire to include assault, rape, and murder. He tracked his victims from the gym and the pool, knowing that soon after they entered their apartments, they would be vulnerable while taking a shower. Prince would then break into their apartments and assault and stab them. 
based on evidence gathered at the scenes, Prince was convicted of six murders. He awaits execution at San Quentin. Cleopas Prince actively sought his victims. Other serial killers wait for their prey to come to them. On May 3, 1983, in San Francisco, two 55-gallon barrels were found in Golden Gate Park. Police had been called to the scene by two hikers who reported a foul odor coming from the barrels. Police suspected they might contain human remains. They were wrapped in plastic, their lids sealed with cement, but one was leaking. They were taken to police headquarters where they were x-rayed before they were opened so as not to disturb any evidence inside. The x-rays were sent to Dr. Boyd Stevens, chief medical examiner for the city and county of San Francisco. One of the barrels had two bodies in it, and that was evident by two complete skeletons, including skulls and spinal columns, etc. cetera. Uh, one of the barrels had one body in it. Um, we couldn't tell the sex at that time, but we could see that there were dental fillings, uh, metal material consistent with uh, bullet uh, fragments or jackets as well as identifying personal items like rings or earrings and so forth. Now that they knew human remains were inside the barrels, investigators had to determine how they got there. Technicians took their time looking for any clues the killer might have left. Kenneth Moses, an inspector at the San Francisco Crime Lab, began by examining the exterior of the barrels. He hoped he could find some sort of print on the packaging or the tape. I but getting fibers. clean fingerprints off tape can be tricky. More oil. Powder won't work because it sticks to everything. And most fingerprint chemicals dissolve the adhesive, destroying the print. Moses tried an experiment. By combining a dark blue dye, an antibiotic, and water, he concocted a dye called crystal violet. He hoped that when the tape was dipped into the solution, the antibiotic would stick to the protein left on a fingerprint, staining it purple. After 14 hours of labor, slowly processing each strip of tape as it came off, we finally got down around 15 or 20 layers of tape to the last layer. Now, no prints were on any of those hundreds of yards of tape. Finally, we peel off the last piece of tape, put it into the crystal violet, and poof, up comes this beautiful fingerprint. A simple magnifying glass revealed another crucial discovery. Presumably, the killer left a clear fingerprint behind in the fresh cement as he sealed one of the barrels. A synthetic polymer was mixed and carefully spread over the print. When it dried, it formed a near-perfect cast, which was then used to make a record of the print on paper. After four days of gathering all they could from the barrel's exteriors, investigators were ready to open them. One yielded the bodies of two nude females who'd been tied together. The women were later identified through their fingerprints as Glenda Wheatley and Paula Rodriguez, two prostitutes. Rodriguez worked for Thomas Michaels, identified as the clothed male victim in the other barrel. Each had been shot in the head. The victims had been ID'd, but the identity of their killer remained a mystery. Police spoke with friends of the victims, but none could shed any light on who could have done this. Investigators also ran the prints, but came up with no matches. Three months after the barrels were found, a man driving on a rural road in California's San Mateo County 
just outside of San Francisco, made a similarly gruesome discovery. He immediately summoned police. He led them to a bound female body with what looked like a bullet wound to the head. A grim trail of shredded clothing punctuated the horrific scene. Detective Sergeant Robert well, Morse deduced what it meant. I need for you to go down to the... She had uh, nylon rope extending from uh, both of her ankles and it appeared as though she had been uh, drugged down the road. Um, and we later measured off the distance and she had indeed been dragged for 1.9 miles. The entire area was secured and each bit of evidence carefully noted. A garbage bag was found near the probable starting point of the brutal dragging. The first task after collecting all of the evidence was to identify the victim. Detectives ran a check on her fingerprints. She was identified as Marsha Geary, a prostitute from Oakland, California. Now, police knew her name. The next question was, how did she die? The autopsy revealed that she had been uh, shot in the back of the head the trajectory going downward approximately 45 degrees. The entrance wound uh, was an oblong shape, which is a little bit unusual. The nylon coated 38 caliber bullet recovered from the victim was also unusual. It had none of the lands and grooves that a gun barrel usually etches on a slug as it passes through. Police were baffled by what kind of weapon could have fired the fatal shot. The garbage bag from the crime scene was closely examined for fingerprints and other trace evidence. The bag was tested with cyanoacrylate, or superglue. When heated, the chemical's fumes attached to the prints, making them visible. A latent footprint was discovered that was much too large to belong to the victim. All investigators needed was a suspect to compare the footprint to. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate that. Police questioned Marcia Geary's friends and family to learn where she'd been and whom she'd met recently. Her father said the last time he saw her, she'd asked him for money. She told him she was trying to find a job and asked him if he would help her get a car. Please, I Police I'll also learned from her friends that she was planning to spend please, the weekend with a man. Right now, Thank you. Thank you. For now, his identity go. remained a mystery. Okay. The day after Marcia Geary was found, the body of Catherine Barrett was discovered in a San Francisco cul-de-sac. She'd been tortured and stabbed to death. Her body was wrapped in plastic. Metal shavings were retrieved from the wrapping. As police investigated this latest murder, they got a tip from a man named Raleigh Hill, the owner of Marsha Geary's apartment. Hill told police that Geary was planning to see a man named Jack for the weekend. Hill didn't know Jack's last name, but he knew he lived in a warehouse. What'd she tell you about Jack? Just that she was going to see him. Bill said that on two occasions, he dropped Geary off there for dates. Hill gave police the address. It was 20 miles from where Geary's body was found. where Jack lives then. Yeah, okay. Get there and where it is. All right, take your team members. The warehouse served as the offices of Anthony Electric, an electrical contracting business owned by a former police officer named Anthony John Sully. We've explained that to you already. 
years. How better you known you? as Jack. Okay, do you have any other questions about it? No. Okay. Investigators also learned that friends of Catherine Barrett, the most recent victim, told them the day before her body was found that she was going to Anthony Electric. The news sparked their interest. The information gave them enough for a search warrant for the warehouse. They were about to learn the shocking truth about Jack Sully. A homicide investigation led to an electrical contractor's warehouse, where two murdered prostitutes were last reported to have been going. Court George Williams, Sam, four five one. A costumed woman wearing a tutu met police at the door. She led them to a small apartment in the rear of the warehouse. Among the litter of drug paraphernalia, police confronted a disoriented, partially clad Jack Sully. As they explored the room, the bizarre scene became grotesque. While well, walking into this apartment, uh, one gets the sense that uh, it's almost like a torture chamber. He had a hook up on the ceiling. He had uh, various ropes around. Uh, he had uh, VCR tapes of pornography and sadism. And one would uh, just get the feeling that it was uh, a horrible place. In a preliminary search of the apartment and surrounding warehouse, police found several important pieces of evidence, including a pistol with the barrel removed. It contained nylon-covered bullets, just like the one that killed Marsha Geary. A gun without a barrel might explain the odd oblong shape of the victim's wound, since a bullet shot from it would tend to be unstable and tumble instead of going straight. Jack Sully was arrested and charged with the murder of Marsha Geary. The warehouse was now a crime scene and subject to a full-blown forensics investigation. We photographed virtually every inch of it. We covered every inch of it. And uh, we're happy that we did because we, we gained a lot of evidence out of it. Among their finds were metal shavings and nylon rope, like those found at the crime scenes. Investigators also found blood, lots of it. The warehouse seemed to be a grim chamber of horrors, an inner sanctum for unspeakable acts of torture and cruelty. With Jack Sully behind bars, police began to ask his acquaintances what they knew about him. They learned he'd bragged about killing three people, putting them in barrels, and dumping them in Golden Gate Park. Now that a suspect was finally in custody, investigators could compare his prints against the ones taken from the barrels of the unsolved triple murder. As soon as he received samples of Sully's prints, Kenneth Moses knew the results. I took a look at the prints, and believe me, I knew those prints by heart. The minute I saw Sully's prints, I knew this was the guy. Sully was charged with the murders of the victims found in Golden Gate Park. Police also obtained his footprints. They compared them to the print lifted from the garbage bag found where Marsha Geary's body had been dragged. The prints matched. In the end, an insurmountable stack of forensics evidence was brought against Jack Sully. Metal shavings found in his warehouse matched shavings found on his second victim's body. The plastic sheeting found around the body of the man sealed in one of the 55-gallon barrels matched sheeting found in Jack Sully's truck. 
from the investigation, Sully's pattern of violence became clear. Under the influence of free-based cocaine, he would pick up prostitutes. When they arrived at his warehouse, he would subject them to prolonged periods of bondage, beatings, and sexual abuse. And ultimately, he murdered them. Forensics linked him to five victims, but other evidence proved he had killed six. On June 3, 1986, Anthony John Sully was convicted of six counts of murder and sentenced to death in California. Serial killers follow no apparent rules except one, to blend in with everyone else. On June 28, 1989, in Riverside, California, two construction workers stopped on the side of the road to eat their lunch. But then they noticed the body of a woman lying at the bottom of an embankment. Officers and forensic technicians from Riverside County Sheriff's Office responded to their call. The victim was dressed in shorts and a man's Western-style shirt. A towel covered her body. She had no identification. The autopsy revealed the woman was strangled to death. A search of the fingerprints file identified her as Tara Biggs, a 28-year-old prostitute. Evidence collected from the crime scene was sent to the California Department of Justice Crime Lab. Investigators found little more than a few assorted fibers. Whoever killed this woman didn't leave much evidence behind. On December 13, 1989, in Riverside, California, another female victim, Pamela Martin, was discovered on a rural road. She appeared to have been killed elsewhere, redressed, and abandoned there. Like the woman found six months earlier, she too was a prostitute. There were other similarities. Police found fibers similar to those found on the first victim. They also found tire tracks. Photographs were taken for examination in the lab. The photographs were blown up to actual size. The tread pattern and wear marks would be unique to the killer's vehicle. Criminalists identified two different brands of tires. They determined the killer probably drove a truck or a van with an alignment problem, causing the front tires to wear more quickly than the rear. The similarities between the crime scenes linked the two murders to a single killer. And he wasn't finished yet. In the 16 months following the discovery of the first victim, six more prostitutes were found murdered in and around Riverside. The information on the tires proved invaluable, according to Steve Sikofsky of the California Department of Justice Crime Lab. As subsequent victims were found, we were armed with the information of what kind of tire track we would be looking for, and that would be one of the first things we could see whether or not, in fact, this is another one of the series that was developing. When area police departments met to compare forensic evidence, they realized that along with the tire tracks, the hair and fiber evidence was consistent. Gray and red fibers, gold threads, and bits of rope were found on most of the bodies. These fibers lifted from the victims literally tied the murders together. We were able to determine that, in fact, it looked like we had the same suspect environment from one victim to the next. And really what that meant to the investigation was it looked like we did, in fact, have a serial killer. With each new murder, the killer grew bolder and more sadistic. Police found the body of another prostitute, Laura Mills, in a grove of trees, stabbed and strangled. A peeled and partially eaten grapefruit lay nearby. 
This odd detail gave police an idea of the kind of monster they were dealing with, according to senior investigator Bob Creed. To where he could just have murdered this person, strangled this person, stabbed this person, and then stood over her and ate a grapefruit. Uh, we, we felt that this told us something about uh, the emotional makeup of this person that we were looking for. Police seemed no closer to finding him. By 1991, 10 prostitutes had been murdered and several had been redressed and left in rural areas. The only clues to the killer's identity were the fibers, hairs, and tire tracks that he left behind. But without suspects, this evidence amounted to nothing. Since the victims were prostitutes and drug users, police questioned women working the red light districts of Riverside and Elsinore. Men known to frequent these areas were investigated as potential suspects. One woman provided a description of a man who had roughed her up. A sketch was made from her description. It was distributed, but no lead surfaced. Investigators hoped to have better luck focusing on the killer's vehicle. The tires left their unique prints on each murder scene, and the interior may have provided the fibers found on the victims. If investigators could find his vehicle, they could find the killer. So we let the investigators know to look for a vehicle with certain type tires on it. Let them know that they might be looking for a vehicle that had gray interior carpet. They might find some rope fibers. They might also find some other things in the van that had gold fibers in it because we found a, a prevalence of gold type fibers maybe some blanket, uh, sleeping bag along that line because of the type fibers that we found on many of the victims. At an earlier murder scene, police found the tread prints of a popular tennis shoe near the victim. As the spree of murders continued, forensic technicians began to see the same prints. As the tennis shoe's print continued turning up, the tread showed increasing wear. Likewise, the tire tracks found at the scenes were changing as individual tires wore unevenly and had to be replaced. In January 1991, detectives from several area agencies met to create a task force. In July, with no end in sight, a behavioral scientist was brought in to study the crimes and create a profile of the killer. Since serial killers rarely kill outside of their race, the profile described a white male between the ages of 35 and 40. The police profile and other news of the serial killings filled the newspapers. It appeared that the suspect himself was following the report, as the next victim was Tracy O'Donnell, who'd been stabbed, strangled, posed, and mutilated. Though she shared these similarities with most of the other victims, one thing made her unique. She was African-American. That he read in the paper that the serial killer stays within their own race, and yet he went out and found this black prostitute and killed her. It seemed like he did that just to show us that we were wrong and that perhaps maybe he selects his victims, uh, that he's in control here. The murderer was maintaining his anonymity, and he was becoming more defiant. By the end of 1991, his victims were being found at the terrifying rate of one per month. 19 dead female prostitutes had been discovered, and there would undoubtedly be more. Investigators in Riverside, California, on the trail of a brutal serial killer, finally got a break on January 9, 1992. An officer patrolling the red light district of Elsinore saw a man speaking to a prostitute from his van. The man drove off, making a right turn without signaling. The officer pulled the van over. 
The driver's name was William Suff. The officer thought his van fit the description of the vehicle of the suspected serial killer. He noticed the tires were mismatched, and each showed a different wear pattern. William Suff was placed under arrest. His van was impounded at the police station and given a thorough inspection. Police found a gold pillow and a sleeping bag. A blood-stained knife was wedged ominously between the driver's seat and the console. Investigators also found a length of rope consistent with rope fibers found on the victims. While the knife and other evidence from the van went to the lab, investigators obtained a warrant to search Suff's home. There, they found a worn pair of sneakers that matched prints found near several of the earlier victims. Officers also found Western-style shirts, like the one that had been found on the first victim, and a stack of vehicle maintenance receipts. Back at the lab, DNA tests were performed on the knife found in Suff's van. The results matched the blood of the last victim. William Suff's blood, saliva, and other bodily fluids were tested to establish his DNA profile for comparison to fluid evidence found on some of the victims. In many cases, it was a match. Fiber from the gold pillow and sleeping bag, along with samples of Suff's hair, also matched evidence found at the crime scenes. Tire marks from Suff's van were consistent with imprints photographed at several locations. The vehicle maintenance records were also helpful in establishing when Suff had his tires rotated or changed. Police kept their own records of the tire positions at each crime scene. When they compared Suff's records with their own notes, they found an exact match. Police were able to surmise William Suff's homicidal pattern. He would cruise the red light districts. Hi. I'm fine. How are you? Doing good. Good. You looking for a date? Looking. When he chose a prostitute, he would invite her into his van and drive to a secluded place. He subdued his victims, tying them so he could torture and rape. Then he killed them, either by stabbing or strangulation. Occasionally, he dressed the victims in articles of his own clothing so he could move them without getting blood in his van. He made no effort to hide the remains. On July 19, 1995, William Suff was convicted of multiple murders. He was sentenced to death 12 times. A serial killer's compulsion for murder never stops. Once he finds a pattern that works, he'll stick with it time and again. But the pattern that provides his success also establishes a trail for those who are sworn to track him down.